Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. G good morning uh, to those of you listening around the world. It's a great pleasure now to go into a half hour session where I'll be talking to Hester Pierce, who's one of the five commissioners at the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States. It's an exciting new time. We've got the Biden administration now in office for 100 days, a new SEC chair or chairman has taken over now, uh, Gary Gensler, who's he's in his week two, having been given his formal approval by the Senate just in the last couple of weeks. And Hester Pierce has been on the commission now for five years, or no, three years actually, but, but you're into your mm -hmm. second term now, uh, having been conducted in for a second term in August last year. So you're something of a veteran, uh, one might say, at the commission. You're also one of three uh, females uh, out of the five person uh, band of commissioners. And you've taken a special interest amongst all your other duties in the area of crypto assets. Could you define for us, please, uh, Hester, there's a time of huge worldwide interest in crypto assets. What is the general regulatory framework for this in the United States? And how do you get the right balance between the desire to protect consumers and investors and also the desire to allow the industry to innovate and let the transformative power of markets work their magic. Well, thanks, David. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, and sometimes it does feel like I've been at the SEC for five years. Uh, certainly the amount of innovation in the crypto space that's happened in the three years that I've been there um, really could have taken many more, uh, many more years than that um, in the normal traditional financial world. So I have to start with my standard disclaimer, which is that the views that I represent are my own views and not necessarily those of the SEC um, or my fellow commissioners, and certainly not those of other financial regulators either. The US is a very complicated regulatory framework. It has uh, regulators at the federal level and the state level who are involved in regulating crypto in some form or fashion. Um, and so the SEC is, is one of two capital markets regulators in the United States. And in that role, we, ha we have a, um, a vantage point over crypto. We certainly have taken some, some regulatory actions with respect to crypto, um, especially when we see it and it, it looks like someone's doing capital raising and doing it in the name, you know, under a crypto banner. We... Um, have brought enforcement actions. Now, I've been calling for regulatory clarity from the SEC because I think we, uh, we the approach that we've taken, which is a very much enforcement-led approach, has led to some uncertainty among people who are who are trying to build things in this space about exactly where our jurisdiction starts and ends. Um, and and part of that is because this is a new technology. It's one that doesn't always fit neatly within one regulatory bucket. Um, so the, the, the banking regulators have some purview, our um, anti-money laundering um, bank secrecy act regulator has purview. The commodity futures trading commission has purview over crypto derivatives um, like Bitcoin futures. And then States have purview in this area um, using money transmission laws. They are um, regulating many actors in this space. And so given that proliferation of uh, regulators, some people have said, you know, there needs to be some more coordinated work here. Now, certainly we are talking with our fellow regulators, but um, recently uh, one, one uh, the, the House of Representatives passed a bill that would require us to work closely with the CFTC to tr try to come up with some clear lines about where our jurisdiction lies. And I expect we might see more of that kind of interest from Congress in, in, in defining those lines better. And how do you think the new chairman will fit into all this? Because uh, he was the chairman of the CFTC. He's then been at uh, MIT, Sloan, um, written a lot, studied a lot, lectured a lot about crypto assets. He seems to have a fearsome reputation. Also, some people in the industry, I think, do rather fear him, that he might be relatively heavy handed. Uh, he's clearly liked by the Biden administration because he's going to be sticking up for the rights of consumers and also trying to prevent fraud and unsavory practices. Do you think there's a danger that he might come down as something of a hammer 
on the industry and stifle the creativity and innovation that they might otherwise be unleashing. Well, you're correct to point out that, that the chairman of the SEC does have a big influence on the direction that it goes. Um, specifically, the chairman sets the agenda for the agency and and is the one, he's the, the boss of the staff of the agency. And so given that, um, it he does have a big influence. And, and you also point out correctly that Chairman Gensler has a lot of very relevant experience. He has uh, run a regulatory agency, our, our fellow regulator, the CFTC. Um, and then he has also has extensive experience in the markets. And he has experience with crypto because he spent time at MIT among, uh, you know, teaching about blockchain and finance, but also among the people who are really innovating and thinking about this space day in, day out. So I actually think that combination of um, experiences it, it will be very helpful to someone who's trying to think about crafting a regulatory framework for crypto. Um, sure, I expect that he'll take investor and uh, investor protection seriously as as any SEC chairman would. Um, but I think he also appreciates the value that a good well-articulated regulatory framework can have. Um, and so I'm looking forward to working with him on that. And I think it could be a very, uh, a very productive few years coming up here where we could really hammer something out that would allow people to have more clarity and then would make it easier, frankly, for us to bring enforcement actions against people who are doing bad things. You mentioned the interest of Congress will take in, in all this. It's quite clear that the whole crypto asset area has become massively interesting and spectacularly uh, hyped as well. Do, what lessons do you uh, draw from the recent Coinbase offering where we saw a, a huge amount of interest in all this, uh, wildly oversubscribed, the issue going well above par on day one? It, it, I mean, when you start getting uh, ordinary investors, the man and women in the street, taxi drivers and so on, interested in uh, Bitcoin and other things, does something in your brain say, well, this isn't quite right? Or do you welcome this, this flurry of activity? Well, there has been a lot of change in the three years that I've been at the commission. I mean, certainly um, now the institutional interest in crypto is much stronger than it was when, when I first joined the commission. And so that I think is is more what this the the Coinbase direct listing it was a big direct listing it drew a lot of attention from mainstream media and from institutional um, you know people in the traditional financial financial uh, legacy financial institutions so I think it it more marks um, maybe a little bit more of the mainstreaming I, I should underscore that some people think that because Coinbase list is, is now a publicly trading company, that that means that we regulate Coinbase in terms of its, its crypto trading platform. And that is not true. So I think it's important that people understand that um, the fact that they're public doesn't, doesn't affect the regulatory structure that applies to them. Um, but, you know, am I worried about, about retail investors participating in the space? Frankly, I, I think that we're long overdue in providing retail investors a way to access this space through our regulated securities markets, through, for example, an exchange traded product. Um, you know, some people feel very comfortable buying crypto directly, but others would like to do so, you know, in conjunction with their, their regular investment portfolio, um, getting advice from the, from the financial advisor that they might normally go to. So I think we should be thinking about um, allowing people access through, through the regulated financial markets. And of course, as with any asset, when people are thinking about buying it, you know, you've got to ask questions. You've got to know what your risk tolerance is. You have to think about the fact that um, can you afford to lose the money you're investing? And so these are, these are just good questions to be asking. I'm always encouraging people to be skeptical, no matter what they're buying. Um, it always pays off to ask questions and to and to you know take care and think about how much you can afford to to lose. 
Well, also, dare I say it, perhaps you do need a few market failures as well to uh, alert people to the idea that these, uh, whether they're securities or assets or commodities, whatever they are, they can go down as well as up. But just on the ETF, I think shortly after you were conducted into the SEC, you you did issue a dissenting voice on the question of uh, crypto ETFs. So you were in a minority there. Do, do you think that as a result of the broadening of the investment base that we have and institutions moving in, as you've said, and the fact that there are lots of questions being asked about it, do you think that now three years later, or maybe it'll be a few more years than that, that the time will be ripe when the SEC and the other regulatory authorities will allow a uh, ETFs for crypto assets to go ahead? Would you like to hazard a guess on when you think that might come up, Hester? Well, everyone's always asking me that question. And, and you know, I'm, I'm watching Canada now has... Bitcoin exchange traded funds, and they also have uh, an ETH, an Ether um, exchange traded fund, or maybe maybe more than one actually. And Brazil just um, moved forward with one, and and other countries have them as well. And so I I keep uh, hoping that we'll we'll you know catch up. And and as I say, I think it really is not a good thing for investors not to have access to this product. Now, of course, the facts and circumstances the way a product is designed matter. And we think about those things when we're considering whether to approve them. Some are based on futures. Some have, you know, they they have different ways of of designing them. And so we would have to look at each individual one on its own, on its own. But honestly, I am concerned that because we used a standard in reviewing the exchange traded products that have come into us so far, that is different than the standard we would apply to similar products. Uh, moving away from that standard will be difficult. Now we have a new chairman, so that's it's an opportunity for us to take a fresh look. Um, and in addition, there's a lot more data now. Um, the the sponsors of these exchange uh, would be exchange traded products have been doing a lot of work to give us data. We have data from the futures markets, which have now been in operation for for some time. We can see what has happened in Canada as well. So I think some of those things suggest that there's more maturity and maybe that will make my my colleagues more comfortable with with approving an exchange traded product. But I can't I can't hazard a guess in terms of timing. Some days I say 10 years from now, some days I say maybe it'll happen this year. I don't know. It it, it all depends on what kind of breakfast you've had, I expect. But funny enough, (laughs) while we uh, while I was putting that question, um, uh, uh, one of the, the audience, uh, Philip Summon from uh, UBS Global Asset Management, he said, uh, what are the remaining obstacles for a US Bitcoin ETF to be approved? Could I take it from what you said that you've mentioned data? You've got a lot of data now. You also mentioned the foreign experience. Uh, is, is that the case, therefore, that you're going to be looking for a lot of foreign experience, both good and bad, probably, whether in Brazil or Canada or Europe, and you're going to be building that in. Because if you were to say that, I think that would be quite a healthy response that you're looking at this uh, in an international way and not just in the United States way. But don't let me put words into your mouth. I mean, how important will the, the foreign experiences and also the foreign data be when you assess this situation? I mean, it's certainly something that is relevant to me as I think about it getting a chance to see how these products trade in other regulated markets. Our standards are not necessarily identical to the standards that other regulators use. And so that matters too. And, and, and so we're, you know, we're looking at a lot of different data points, but I think the foreign experience is one that isn't, it's informative. Good. Well, we're getting several questions from the audience and we've got another 15 minutes or so to go. So please do keep sending them in. Uh, one uh, from uh, Manuela Barrera, who's from the Banco de la Republic of Colombia. Uh, he's, he wants to talk about the bad things. You mentioned people doing bad things. He says, what are the considerations in relation to cyber crime and the Budapest Convention? Is, can you say a few words about that, please, Hester? Well, I, I can't speak to the Budapest Convention specifically. Um, I'm happy to if the if the questioner wants to give me a little more background on that. But with, with respect to cyber crime specifically, you know, I think there's been a lot of focus on that from government authorities and others who are, who are skeptical of crypto because it has been used in, in certain high profile, um, you know, events, ransomware attacks and things like that. 
And then, of course, in connection with illicit activity like uh, online drug markets and those kinds of things. And I, I understand that concern. Um, but when you actually look at the numbers that the, the U.S. dollar is used in, in more um, illicit activity because people like to use cash uh, in illicit activity, then is crypto. Crypto leaves a footprint. And so it's, it's not actually likely to be as popular at, uh, for illicit activity as, as some people think it is. Now that said, any, any technology is gonna be used for good, it's gonna be used for bad. And we need to think about ways to, to be able to get the insight we need as, as government regulators. Um, but balancing that of course with privacy concerns, which are important as well. Crypto, uh, as these cases, these rather lurid high pro price case, uh, cases do show uh, when it comes to ransom or hostages or other sort of international in illicit activity, they are uh, affairs that go around the globe. Uh, it's a G20 issue, isn't it? Uh, d do you think that the question about the, the licit use of Bitcoin and making sure that illicit activities, whether uh, money laundering, uh, cyber crime, uh, use in ransom and so on will be proscribed. Do you think this is something that should be given a, a greater, higher profile in the very considerable agenda that the G20 has already? You, would you want to promote that still further onto the wish lists of the world leaders? Well, there's actually a lot of cross-border work on crypto, um, trying to understand it jointly and trying to figure out different regulatory approaches and trying to think about how to to, to walk together in a reasonable um, in a reasonable way because obviously a lot of these projects are going to touch people in in many different jurisdictions at once and so I think that's important you know just one other point on the on the use of, of crypto for illicit activity I, I think it's also really important to remember that crypto can play a really valuable role in in, in being um, a tool for people who are in vulnerable positions, whether it's you know in a refugee camp or whether it's a woman who is um, is under the control of a, a very domineering and and uh, a husband who's trying to control her every move, she might be able to um, earn some some crypto uh, on by doing work, programming work, for example, um, and she can get paid and she can then escape from a dangerous situation. So I think sometimes we tend to focus only on the negative, but crypto can be quite empowering also. Um, and so we, we always need to balance that conversation. Well, I want to get on to one or two questions on uh, digital currencies as well, because you could make the same point about that regarding say the, the unbanked, but one or two questions still coming in um, on uh, one, one on tokens, for instance, this is from Christopher Williams as chairman of RT pay, do you see the recent proposal for tokens on US stocks, such as Tesla, to be traded offshore as a first step towards what could be, he says, a fairly dangerous situation? Well, I mean, there there certainly is the possibility. I mean, it's not surprising to me that people are thinking about, can we tokenize stocks? And, um, and that may well be the direction that our our equity markets take to that, that all stocks one day will be tokenized. Um, but certainly when we see something like that happening um, at the SEC, it is, it's something that we pay attention to. And if it's happening in the United States, um, then that, that could, if people really need to be thinking about implications um, in terms of, of being covered by this U S securities laws. So um you know, people have to be very careful when they start engaging in tokenizing stocks that trade in the United States. Yeah, so be be careful, uh, but uh, you're not saying that this is going to lead to an instant red flag, but it's something where you can see some potential red flags. Uh, I've got another question here now about the general uh, regulatory environment, which many people have described as somewhat Byzantine in the United States. Uh, this is from Paul Sheard. Uh, from the Harvard Kennedy School. And a simple question, which I'm sure doesn't have a simple answer, where is the demarcation between the SEC and the CFTC on crypto likely to land? I mean, between yourself and, and Gary Gensler, you should be able to work this one out, I would have thought. 
Well, I think we're, we're definitely at an advantage because our chairman has been the chairman of the CFTC. So he knows that jurisdiction well, and he knows our jurisdiction well um, also. I mean, the, the existing lines of demarcation where the CFTC is responsible for the, for the futures markets, and to some extent, some of the activity in the underlying spot markets, the CFTC can reach, although that is quite a limited reach. Um, I, you know, I think there are going to be questions about whether people want spot crypto markets to be regulated um, by a single regulator in the United States. I'm not necessarily taking a position on that. I mean, I think that self-regulation can work very well also, and um, exchanges can get together and they can they can come up with a self-regulatory framework, uh, perhaps. Um, so there are different models to there are different different regulatory approaches that that you could take, but um, it's it's possible that either that Congress would come in and say, well, we want we want there to be a federal financial regulator with responsibility for the spot markets. Any idea when you might be coming to a decision on that? Again, hazarding a guess about the future, always a dangerous game. But within the next couple of years, at least, we should be certainly seeing some clarity on that, would you not say? Well, possibly. I mean, again, crypto is still a relatively small asset class. And so how much time, because this would really require congressional intervention. And so how much time um, Congress is going to spend thinking about it? It's, it's anyone's guess. Certainly, I don't have any, any special insight into that. Good. Uh, a personal question here from uh, uh, Henri Arslanian, who's a global crypto leader at PwC, and is a slightly sly kind of question, really. He says, you obviously have many fans in the global crypto community. Does this stance uh, create some internal issues, he asks, with your, quotes, more conservative colleagues, end quote. So you can be, I'm sure, reasonably diplomatic in answering that. Well, I also have a lot of enemies. So <laughs> uh, based on based on comments that I get in my Twitter feed, I, I uh, certainly um, have, there's, there's no love lost for, from some people. So I think that that balance um, probably makes my colleagues happy. Do you get more mail of different sorts, more uh, Twitters and other kinds of communications on crypto than anything else? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And I mean, to be fair, I think I'm the only one of my colleagues on Twitter. So if they were on Twitter, they'd have they'd have uh, lots of people. Well, what about letters, postcards? Do, do people write postcards any longer? Do you get any angry people or, or very benevolent people sending you postcards? You get a lot of mail anyway. Well, I, uh, crypto people aren't so much into, into snail mail, but I do get, um, I did get a Mother's Day card, which was, which was kind of funny. Uh, but not from your son or daughter, from somebody else? No, from my, one of my crypto uh, people who, who call me Crypto Mom. Oh, right. OK. Well, anyway, that's, that shows you've got a sense of humour about all this, which one has to have, I, I suppose. Now, quite a few questions coming in on the international side. I want to bring in the, the uh, digital currency as well. This has come up a lot also in our symposium, a fascinating conversation with the People's Bank of China yesterday, uh, where the gentleman was saying that China needs a crypto uh, or digital asset, its own currency, to be digitalized in order to, A, show independence, um, I think, from the private sector, and B, to stand up for, for its sovereignty. Um, so that was a, quite a, uh, an interesting and rather surprising comment from the People's Bank of China. It, it, do you see this also in terms of the United States, that you're going to need to digitalize the dollar at some stage uh, in order to stand up to some uh, mythical competition from the Chinese renminbi. Do, do you see that in very stark terms that it's sort of the United States against China in the digital world? Uh, how do you see that? Well, I think the Fed is certainly thinking about, I mean, they've, they've said that they're thinking about, uh, you know, whether there should be a CBDC in the United States. And of course, a CBDC anywhere raises questions about privacy. And I think the, the, the Chinese um, one CBDC certainly raises those questions. And so if we were going to have one in the United States, because we have very strong principles on um, personal liberty and privacy, it would be a very complicated thing to do, but certainly one that, that the Fed and others are thinking about. Now, 
there are a lot of stable coins and this has been a year of um, even in 2021, there's been a tremendous growth in stable coins. These are private, essentially private um, do- digital, digital dollars. And because most of them are dollar backed, there are some now that are, that are not backed, um, that are crypto backed, but, but, you know, that effectively may be our answer to um, the Chinese CBDC. It, it may be just private stable coins. Yeah, so it, you sound pretty unworried about whether the RMB is going to emerge as a digital rival to the mighty dollar. Is, is that going to happen any time over the next 10 years? Well, I mean, I you know, it's hard for me to speculate on those kinds of things, but I think that, um, that you know, given the rise of stable coins, I, I would say I, I'm expecting to see that rise likely to continue. Um, and so if they're dollar back, then I think that, that they'll, the dollar will still be uh, quite, uh, quite relevant. And coming back to a subject which is maybe a bit closer to what the SEC does and go back to the ETFs, uh, a question has come in um, because you mentioned that a number of countries are already more advanced in accepting crypto as a legitimate asset class Uh, including in the ETFs. So do you see that as a danger for the securities industry or the banking industry in general, that uh, other countries might be forging ahead in that ETF area? That's another question that's come in from PwC. I mean, I do see it as a, as a problem. I think it's, I I don't know that I would frame it in, in terms of international competition as much as just saying, you know, when you wait until an asset class like Bitcoin is, is as large as it is. And as I said, it's still a relatively small asset class, but once now, once an, e- an exchange traded product starts, it's, it's, it's much bigger than it would have been three years ago. And so it's much harder for us to jump into the game. Um, and so I, I really just think it's more less about an international kind of um, competition than about depriving American investors of a product that they would like to have access to and that they're, you know, now getting access to through other venues that may be less tax efficient, maybe less, just less convenient for them and, and not providing them the protection that they, that they would like to have. So it's more for me an investor protection concern. Uh, final question, because we're getting into the last two or three minutes here. We've spoken quite a bit about the international environment. Have you found it uh, as easy as before during this phase of the pandemic to keep in touch with your international peers? Because in a lot of these areas, whether it's it, over money laundering or other illicit activities, fighting against crime in general, or through to issues which we've discussed about uh, crypto ETFs, it's very necessary to take into account international experience, what, what would you wish to improve in terms of international cooperation in the next couple of years? Well, I actually think during the pandemic, there's been, in some sense, an improvement because, you know, doing meetings virtually, especially international meetings, is really a great thing. And so I was involved um, with the, with one of the financial stability boards, subcommittees, and we could meet much more frequently during the pandemic because we did it by phone. And so I actually think this is, this is a good development. um, And I hope it's one that will continue post pandemic, realizing that having people fly in from all over the world, maybe that's good periodically so that you, you know, you can put a face and a name and a voice, all everything together, but it really is not necessary. and, And it's easier to keep up common frequent communication if you don't have to do that. So there's been a lot of joint work on crypto and many other topics. And I and I expect that will continue. And I think that's extremely important. You, you probably eat and drink less when you don't meet people for dinners as well. So that <laughs> might have some, uh, some, some, some remedial benefits. benefits. Just the final question, because we're in our last minute. If you had to choose, Hester, you know, what do you really want to see on the SEC's agenda as a, being accomplished in the next two to three years? You've got still another four and a half years. What would you say, your wish list, that the five of you that you'd like to see succeeding in that next period of time? Well, with respect to crypto specifically, I'd like to see some action. I've just put out a new version of my uh, a safe harbor 
Um, it's on GitHub. Anyone can comment on it. I'd love to see something like that put into uh, the rule the rule book. I'd love to see an exchange traded product for Bitcoin and one for for ETH. Likely, um, I think that that's the time is 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 near there. And I'd like more clarity around custody for um, institutions trying to deal with um, crypto assets. Well, good. Let's keep up the the dialogue. I think it's really great to talk to you here. Uh, we'll we'll get you back again. I think to give a a bit of a, an update on your agenda. But thank you so much, Hester, for joining us today. And I'm Thanks, going to David. hand you back. Thank you, Hester. I'm going to hand you back to the studio. We're going on to another panel discussion now in the next phase on cryptocurrencies. So thank you all very much for listening. And Hester, thank you for your time. Thank you. Goodbye.